Okay, there we go. We're recording. Um, so feel free to use the chat function. Uh, we might not answer your question straight away, but at the end of each presenter's um, section, we will stop and run through the chat. So uh, any questions that you might have throughout the presentation for an individual presenter or for the group, uh, we'll be able to um, answer those throughout the pre uh, program. And please stay on topic with electric vehicles. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, topics that people might want to discuss around sustainability and emissions. Um, and we will we'll be discussing uh, carbon emissions, but it'll be focused on electric vehicles. And we, we just ask you to keep the, the topic at the top of your mind. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I speak, am speaking to you from today, the Darug people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So we're just going to launch a poll. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody's used polls in Zoom before. Uh, so we're going to ask you about uh, your EV status. So if you currently own an EV, um, or if you want to buy an EV in the next 12 months, you want to buy an EV, but you don't know when, you don't know enough about EVs yet, and, or you don't think that EVs will work for your needs. So that might be because you tow a heavy boat or you drive long distances, and therefore you don't think that an EV will ever be suitable for you. And hopefully through our presentation tonight, we can provide some information about uh, the suitability of EVs and how we can make them work or how they will, might work for you. Okay. I'll just um, leave that up for another minute while uh, I introduce the presenters. Uh, so we've got um, Bayhad Jafari. Um, Bayhad is the CEO of the Electric Vehicle Council. Bayhad works with industry, government, and the media to accelerate the electric, electrification of road transport for a more sustainable and prosperous Australia. With experience advising politicians, business and not-for-profits, Bayard has a strong understanding of Australia's political, corporate and media landscapes. We also have uh, Dr. Kim Liu. Uh, Kim is a local resident, uh, the New South Wales Chair of the Doctors for the Environment New South Wales, and a GP who practices in Western Sydney. Kim is passionate about the environment and climate change and has taken steps to improve her environmental footprint by purchasing an electric car, solar panels, and a home battery. Tonight, Kim will share some information about the human health impacts of air pollution and her personal experience and the practicalities of owning a Nissan Leaf electric car. And myself, Zach. Uh, I'm the Water and Energy Projects Officer at the Hillshire Council. And I work to reduce council's uh, energy and water consumption. And just for full disclosure, Bayard and Kim both own an electric car, but I do not. I've got a Ford Ranger. So uh, maybe you can convince me to sell it up and buy a, a Rivian Ute by the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, so we'll just look at the results from that poll. So we can see, oh, sorry, we can see. Um, that most people in this presentation are interested in buying a car in the next 12 months and or um, want to buy an electric car but don't know when. Uh, so hopefully we can give you some more information and you might work out that you can buy an EV sooner than you think. And we've got two, two participants who already own an EV. So we're already preaching to some of the converted. I think Dr. Kim might be one of those people. Okay, we do have one other poll that I was hoping to um, get everyone to uh, complete. And this one is, what would your concerns be with EVs? And that might include the range and, or distance that an EV can travel, uh, the time it takes. Um, uh, sorry, the time it takes to recharge, the purchase costs. Uh, the resale value of an EV in a few years when you go to sell it, uh, the type of EVs currently available. So you might want a small truck or a van and you don't think that there's an EV suitable for you at the moment. Um, 
people, some people are concerned that batteries aren't easily replaced um, or, or the towing capacity. You know, in the last federal election, that became a bit of a hot topic that uh, electric vehicles wouldn't be able to tow your boat or your caravan. Um, so we might ask Bayad a, a little bit about that later. Uh, just while those last few answers are coming in, um, Oh, we're doing pretty well. Most of them have come through. Um, I might have a look at our emissions per capita. I'll just quickly do that while the last few answers for the poll come in. So in the Hillshire Council, uh, the Hillshire uh, Council average for the population is 10.37 tonnes per person of CO2e emissions. So CO2e means CO2 equivalent. And so if you emit methane, it's calculated to be equivalent to CO2 so that it can be easily um, compared across uh, all the different um, emission groups. And across Greater Sydney, we can see that it's 9.66. Now, these numbers might seem a little bit um, distant or different to what uh, you're used to. So our national average is closer to 20 per person, but the national average takes in a few different categories that these local emissions don't cover, like mining, um, air travel, uh, farming. So they contribute to the national average. But when we're just looking at Sydney, you can see the Hillshire Council um, residents emit about 7.3% more than the average Sydney um, person. Uh, I'll just go back to that poll while I think we've got most of the answers. Um, so we can see that a lot of people are concerned about uh, the range and distance, uh, the time it takes to recharge, the purchase cost uh, or, or the resale value. So we, it's a pretty even spread amongst those. We don't have too many people concerned with um, towing. Um, but if you've got any other concerns, you can put them in the chat and we can um, look at that later. Okay, I'll just push along. Um, so with our community emissions, we can see that about 49% of our emissions come from electricity use. So that's got to do with uh, the national energy market and the, the sources of energy from, uh, a lot of it's coming from coal. Uh, which produces a lot of uh, carbon emissions. We also have about 30% coming from transport. So as the green, the national energy market um, becomes more green with wind and solar farms replacing uh, coal-fired power stations, we'll see that our electricity share starts to decline, uh, decline and we'll see that uh, our transport will decline as electric vehicles become more prominent. So we're going to focus on electric vehicles, obviously. Oh, sorry, that's the graph that I was just talking to. It didn't change slides there. So as you can see, yeah, that's the green is our electricity use and transport is the pink. Now, if we look at uh, the emissions per suburb uh, on the left-hand side, we can see that all of, a lot of our emissions are coming from the southern suburbs, which are the more populated suburbs. So that's Castle Hill, Borkham Hills, West Pennant Hills, Kellyville, Bella Vista. And those suburbs have higher populations. So of course they're going to have uh, higher emissions. But when we factor in population size uh, and break it down per capita, the emissions profile isn't as easy to um, pinpoint to geographic regions. So you can see these suburbs on, along here, that's Box Hill and the Gables. And I think there might be a little bit of a data issue there with the rapid increase in population that we've had. So the census data might not quite match what's actually happens, happening. So we can probably ignore these a little bit, but you can see as we move further north, uh, the emissions tend to rise. And that has a little bit to do with uh, traveled, uh, distance traveled. Now on the next slide, we can break down which sectors of our industry of producing those emissions. So we can see that uh, residential emissions make up for almost 55% of our community emissions. 
Uh, that's followed by the retail sector at 25%. And then the other uh, non-residential uh, sectors such as commercial, health, industrial, and education. So we're gonna focus on the residential emissions and try and break them down a little bit more. So breaking down the residential emissions, we can see that transport makes up 46.5% of our emissions for a household. So this is household emissions now. Uh, of that, we can see, we can also see electricity makes up 42.8%. So knowing that uh, solar panels at home will heavily reduce your household emissions. And Kim will talk about this a little bit later. She has a solar panels and a solar battery. So she doesn't rely on the electricity grid very much at all. So that would heavily reduce um, this pink side. And our transport, a lot of it is coming from uh, petrol and diesel powered cars. So we'll have a look at the transport and break that down a little bit. Now, as you can see here, the green is residential uh, travel by car and the red is residential um, travel by car as a passenger. So they're both by car and combined, they make up 82.4% of our uh, travel transport emissions. Uh, transitioning to electric vehicles will create a dramatic reduction in the emissions created by travel um, for our residents. So that, that'll be a huge transition. And we already know that the state government is transitioning buses to electric vehicles. So there's another big chunk. So you can already see huge chunks um, reducing our carbon emissions in the future, obviously, not yet. Okay, so now we're going to look at the distance traveled uh, per person. And when we look at the, this map on the left here, it shows again that the areas with high populations in the south of the hills have higher total travel. Uh, when we factor in the population of these suburbs, uh, we can see uh, that the distance traveled by car is higher per population in the northern suburbs, as we would expect, because they live further away from everything. Uh, what this also shows us is that the population in the southern parts of the hills, on average, travel between seven and 12,000 kilometres per year. So that's these beige coloured suburbs. And you can see the, the category that they fit into there. Uh, so all of these suburbs, on average, per person, travel uh, less than 12,200 kilometres per year. Um, and the average for the whole Shire is 12,700, which sits between uh, the average in Sydney and the national average. Um, and if we break down that, the, the 12,700, that worked out to be about 250 kilometres per week. Uh, this is an exciting set of statistics because it shows that on average, electric vehicles are suitable and capable of meeting the daily travel requirements of our residents. Now, as we all know, averages don't tell the whole story. And if you're driving to Brisbane or you're driving to Canberra, um, that's not going to, to meet your weekly average of 250 kilometers. Um, and the average person for the, the whole Shire doesn't necessarily represent how your emissions and your travel um, will play out. So we're going to talk to Kim and Bayad about um, how owning an electric vehicle works in reality when you're, you are traveling these sort of distances. And we'll get a bit more information. So what I'll do, I'll ask Kim, Dr. Kim to unmute and um, take over here. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, okay, Kim. Okay, good, I can. Okay, so now I have been talking about vehicle missions now, giving lectures to medical students and communities for about five years. And um, a lot of the pollutants we know about and have been years of studies about. Next slide. So it came to fruition when the state government announced their vehicle policy and our transport minister actually stated that air pollution from motor vehicles have got studies, good studies to show that increases the risk of dementias, cancers, the um, brains of children and all the things I've been advocating and talking about regarding emissions from motor vehicles, the air pollution from motor vehicles was spouted by our transport minister. So all these years of advocacy 
within talking to politicians and people um, and my community and the more doctors than just me talking about it has meant that our politicians now understand why transitioning our transport sector that to, um, to electricity, to electrify it, really is so much healthier for us in the community. Next slide. Oh, I should say that's me and my daughter in that photo, <laughs> in the double spread in, in the daily. So that's the Daily Telegraph. Um, it was a double spreader on a Saturday in a motoring section of the Daily Telegraph, that, that um, picture. So this is a photo that um, it was a year ago. I was driving along Windsor Road and it just looked terrible. There were a few trucks ahead and I, my daughter took this photo. And this is kind of emblemic of, of around Windsor Road when it's chockers with traffic. You can actually see the air pollution. And if you wind down the window, you can smell it. Next slide. And, you know, the combustion engine has been around for so long. Since 1901, we had our first combustion engine in Australia. And in 2002, we phased out lead from petrol. Um, and because we know that lead has an impact because it's such a toxin to all systems in the body. And we know at this point in time, Australian cars pollute more than other cars in other comparable countries. And our fuel quality, I saw a table of fuel quality for Australia compared to 100 other, other countries and we're sitting around about 80. We have so much sulfur in our fuels. Next slide. So we know this is data from the Climate Council. We know Australia-wide that it's the third largest source of greenhouse gases and it's risen the most at 60% since 1990. And cars are half of, private cars are half of Australia's emission transports. No greenhouse gas emission standards. There are no greenhouse uh, gas emission standards for cars and heavy vehicles in Australia. And an international scorecard ranked Australia as the worst for transport energy efficiency. Next slide. So what is air pollution? Air pollution is a big soup of particles and we have some liquid particles called gaseous pollutants and then we've got the solid particles. And it looks like it's a complicated slide, but there are years of data from almost 40 years from the US regarding all these pollutants. Nitrous dioxide what is what we measure and there have been studies in Australia related to um, nitrous dioxide from the tailpipe of cars. When you put petrol in your car and that smell you can smell is the volatile organic compounds. And we know they're toxic. Um, and then there's carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And during summer, ozone is a, what we call a gaseous, um, a gaseous pollutant that's made by um, a photo, the sunlight, sunlight in summer changes the um, nitrous dioxide, which combines with, with uh, the volatile organic compounds and you get a toxic sort of gas called ozone. So during hot, bright days in summer, we have another air pollution that actually we know causes even normal lungs to be irritated and that uh, can exacerbate asthma in kids and actually irritate the lungs of people with chronic airways disease. Now, particulate matter, are the solid particles that actually are emitted by cars. And it can be a secondary compound from the sulfur dioxide from cars as well. So what we know about PM 2.5, the particles are so small that we breathe them in and it goes into our bloodstream and into our organs. And so what we know from PM 2.5 is that it can increase the risk of cancer, lung disease, heart disease. It increases the risk of heart attacks and strokes and the uh, data from Australia and years of data from other countries. Uh, next slide. So this is, the, this is the most robust study we've done in Australia regarding children and their um, lung function. So this was started in uh, 2012. And what they did was each, uni each uni major university, that university was chosen to actually work with schools that were two kilometers away from an ambient air quality monitor. 
Now, in, a, in New South Wales, New South Wales has the most number of quality um, um, air, air, ambient air quality monitors. And what that means is when you say ambient air quality, the, air, the monitor is away from the point of emission. So that, and we've got about 60 monitors in New South Wales looking at all those pollutants that I showed you in the previous slide. So what they did with these primary school kids was they chose from seven to 10 year olds and the schools were two kilometers away from an air quality monitor. So, and they were in reasonably high traffic areas. And what, we, what is really, one of the really reliable things is that they had a device to measure the amount of nitrous dioxide, which is the car pollutant they chose when kids breathed out into this monitor, it could measure the amount of nitrous dioxide they breathed out. And what they also did was they checked the lung function with a peak flow meter. So the kids that were in the study had their nitrous dioxide, the car pollution they were measuring, nitrous dioxide they breathed out and their lung function. And they found that two thirds of kids who had a higher nitrous dioxide, actually it actually induced um, wheezes, wheezing, and kids with asthma were worse. So this was this is a really robust study because we had really the we could keep the standard for each school um, consistent with the air quality monitor, and because the way it was measured was really accurate. So we know that all those cars that are picking up kids and idling at schools is really not good for the airway of children. And that's why there have been trials to actually stop cars idling at schools because the amount of toxic car pollutants in that area is really irritating for young lungs. Next slide. And this is the Barcelona study. The Spanish have done a whole batch of studies looking at car pollution and um, children's brains. So they did, uh, they looked at schools that were close to uh, high traffic areas and schools that were away from high traffic areas. And they chose seven to 10 year olds again. And the schools were chosen in Barcelona. And they measured the nitrous dioxide and the really small particles PM 2.5. And so these were the things they tested. They tested for working memory and attention. Uh, and working memory is where you can actually do, say, if you're doing maths, you can do long division. So it's the way you actually process the, um, your thought processes. And they tested four times over 12 months. And they found that the kids that were in schools close to high traffic areas had so, slower development of their cognitive function. So car pollution is affecting the brains of children. And the, the um, Spanish are now also doing this study with pregnant women to see the impacts on, um, on the babies. So that is yet to come out. Next slide. So the solutions are pretty clear, active transport, public transport and electric vehicles. And electric buses, I think are being already trialed in Penrith. Next slide. Okay, so this is a slightly distorted photo of August 2019 when I bought my beautiful Nissan Leaf. This is Sandy who sold it to me. And Sandy really understood, um, uh, understands car pollution because she lives near a major road and she says that her window sills are always coated with dust and she can't really open the windows because of the car pollution would actually pollute the inside of her house. So Sandy really is passionate about electric vehicles and my Nissan dealer is within 15 minutes walk of my house. So I'll go to the next slide. So now this is my cost for electricity per month and it's on the 14 month average. So I installed, after actually reducing my energy usage within the house and making my house more thermally efficient, I, in 2015, I got my Tesla seven kilowatt hour, hour battery and four kilowatts of solar panels on my, um, on my four kilowatts of solar panels. So then in 2019, I bought my car. So I had a Subaru Forester and I was spending about $120 per month on petrol. So since I've actually um, 
had my Nissan Leaf, my house and car bill in terms of running, the running costs have been really low. So this is an app for one, one month. Um, it's the $56.95. And I just got my quarterly power bill and it was $180 for three months for house and car. So the amount I've saved in terms of um, on energy, the cost of energy has been like phenomenal. And my energy provider also only sources from renewable um, energy sources, which is wind, solar and hydro. So, uh, so I am so happy that I'm saving so much money and I'm not producing pollution and I'm not reliant on coal because, yes, um, New South Wales, most days 60 to 80%, more towards 80% is reliant on black coal. So, and I advocate um, for climate change and we know that emissions are related to our, our frequent heat waves, which is a major problem with health now. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kim, that was really great. Um, so that we've covered pretty heavily there, the, the emissions side of electric vehicles and the benefits that uh, moving to electric vehicles will have. Uh, we've had a few questions come in, but what we might do with uh, the questions about vehicle safety and uh, batteries catching fire or exploding and crash risk, we might hold on to those till the end of um, Bad's presentation, because um, I think that'll flow quite nicely into our discussion at the end. So um, Bad, I'll ask you to come off mute and uh, if you want to take over. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me here. Really appreciate you're giving some time up tonight uh, for this discussion. So quickly on me, my name's Behad Jafari. I run an organization called the Electric Vehicle Council. We're actually an industry association. So we, we represent some, you know, about 75 companies here in Australia who are investing in, whether it's selling electric vehicles, charging them, uh, you know, energy companies or technology companies, really helping build out the industry uh, behind what's happening with this global trends towards electric vehicles based on sort of companies that are both serving Australian consumers, but quite a few of them now also um, expanding out globally and sort of taking over the world. If we can jump onto the next slide, I'm not going to speak on this next slide very, uh, no, sorry, just the one after that. Um, I'm not going to, okay, sorry, my slides are in a slightly different order. I want to talk a little bit about um, what's happening globally and what's happening nationally and then dive into particularly what's happening for the 50 odd people in this room. Um, I do a lot of these things and I shamelessly say the part that I enjoy the most is getting to speak with all of you rather than hearing the sound of my own voice the whole time. So I'm gonna to try to be brief with most of these areas. But first of all, when we look at that, where is the world going on electric vehicles and what are the challenges that are uniquely in front of Australia and for you know people like in areas like the Hillshire Council. First thing to note is that our market looks quite slightly different to what where the rest of the world sits when it comes to EVs. So our market today sort of resembles where other countries in particularly the developed world were sort of seven, eight, nine years ago now. Um, the number of more electric vehicle models and more affordable ones available in those markets, the number of sort of more charges deployed, it's certainly higher. And what you can see here is the number of sales that have occurred that is the market share of all vehicle sales in those countries and how many of them are electric. As you can see, a lot of countries now bumping up to above 10%. Fact, places like uh, EU and the UK have jumped up to about a quarter of all new vehicles that they sell being electric. Whereas we started from quite low base uh, over these last three years in Australia, at below 1%. But the really good news in Australia is we are seeing that starting to skyrocket. So we're seeing uh, each month a doubling of sales from where they were last year. Um, and that growth continuing to accelerate. So, you know, we were looking a few months ago at 1.5 times sales from the year before, then a doubling of sales in the year before, and that's continuing to grow. Um, as a result, seeing a lot more investment in things like more public charging stations in the country, more vehicles being bought to the country, making them more accessible for people to buy, and that creating a sort of nice virtuous cycle in there being more electric vehicles available, more people are buying them, more keep coming here and that continues to grow. If we can jump onto the next slide, please. Um, 
So as I mentioned, for quite a few years, Australia was looking reasonably stagnant around 2,000 electric vehicle sales, electric vehicles being sold every year. Um, that did jump up to just above 6,000. Um, what you're seeing on the very far right graph there is the first six months of 2021, we sold more electric vehicles than we did in all of 2020 or all of 2019. And now looking well on track to reach almost 20,000 uh, EVs sold in this year, and then the projections for the coming years looking far higher again. So while it took us a bit longer to get off the mark, th things are looking quite bright for Australia now. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about emissions because we've covered it in quite a bit of detail, but I think just to sort of repeat a few of the points from what the last few speakers have said, really important to note when we do talk about emissions, we spend a lot of time talking about things like coal fire power and, uh, and electricity, but of course, that's not where emissions ends. Transport today nationally makes up the third largest source of our emissions. And most worryingly at the moment, it's projected to be our fastest growing source as well. So while there's a global conversation about how do we reduce or eliminate emissions in Australia and transport, we're actually still go growing. Um, just to sort of help bring this down to earth a little bit, I think you guys saw some of the work from Hillshire City Council and stacks up to what we see uh, across the place, which is th this is if we take a sort of national lens that includes businesses and manufacturing and everything else. But particularly if you think about your house and the emissions being caused there, in fact, transport isn't the third highest source, it's the largest source of emissions being created. So a really great opportunity for people to start making the switch when that's possible for them and eliminating a big source of emissions for them. I, uh, Zach, you earlier challenged me to see if I can convince you to go electric soon. So I did the maths on your Ford Ranger, creating something like a two, 230 grams of CO2 per kilometre over what is an average of 12,700 kilometres travelled each year by people in Hillshire Council. That's about three tonnes of CO2 emissions. So weighing that up against what is an average of about 10 tonnes of CO2 emissions from each resident each year, that's an ability to get rid of 30% of your emissions right away just by switching that car over to a zero emissions one. So there's, there's one good argument for you and we'll try to make a few more as we go along. Next Thanks, slide, Brad. Thanks, Brad, that's great. <laughs> that's welcome. Um, so what I wanted to share with you were some of the findings and I guess a few of the insights behind them and the responses to something that we've actually just launched this morning, which is each year we do a survey through a number of independent bodies uh, this time through carsales.com.au, asking Australians how they feel about electric vehicles, what their concerns are, um, helps us inform what more, what better information and products and things we can help create in order to address those concerns to help more people go electric. The really great thing that we find though is, and we found this consistently every year, is that enthusiasm for electric vehicles for Australians is quite high. And so I guess that by being here, there's some interest or enthusiasm by most people on wanting to understand a bit more. And um, when we ask people not, will you buy an electric vehicle, but would you like to, as long as the right one was available. So as long as a revenue and large a nice replacement for a Ranger was available to you, would you make the leap? We find that more than half of people say yes. So that demonstrates for us that there's a quite good opportunity there, as long as we can help tackle a few issues. If you go to the next slide, we'll look into what some of those benefits are, as well as what some of those issues are. I think what's really well recognized is that, yes, electric vehicles today cost more to buy than an equivalent petrol or diesel vehicle, but the operating cost for them, the fuel and maintenance costs is somewhere, something like a fifth of the price. So you're paying far less for things like electricity. Maintenance is far, far lower because there are so many fewer moving parts on an electric vehicle that if you consider how much that vehicle is going to cost you over, say, five or six years that you're going to hold on to that car and own it for, you'll start to see that actually there's a lot more competition there. The, the two vehicles are a lot, the petrol and the electric vehicle are a lot more competitive. That doesn't mean in every case today an electric vehicle will be the cheaper option for you. But if you do take a real assessment of how many kilometres you travel each year, how much you're paying for petrol today, uh, how much you would be paying for electricity instead, if you have things like rooftop solar panels that you've already paid for, that'll bring down that cost even further. You may well find that for some people, actually going electric is already the cheaper option for you, um, even though you'll be spending a bit more upfront. Of course, a whole range of other uh, considerations like being able to reduce your environmental footprint, um, things like the 
added safety features that are somewhat inherent in the design of an electric vehicle. I know there are a few questions, so I might leave that for things like questions. Um, but particularly, I think really important to look at what are things that are standing in the way. Um, and there's the range of, and here's where we find those bottom three, range there is about the number of different electric vehicles to help choose from. So again, really useful there to understand, well, what type of different models and what type of different options are people interested in um, and what is it that they are looking for? We'd love to be in a situation where we can provide an electric vehicle that is, you know, every hundreds of different types of electric vehicles that meets uh, all different needs. And that day is certainly going to come at some point in the not too distant future. But all, as we're getting there, you know, what are those top preferences? What can we do to help more people uh, bridge that gap and decide to go electric? Um, access to charging infrastructure is a particularly interesting one for us because this is one that we find that the more time we can spend with consumers to understand how they'll be using an electric vehicle, how charging is somehow somewhat different to refueling in that you're not going to a place standing beside your car, refueling, driving on. And then particularly where charging is already available, places like at your home, at your shops, the amount of places that do have public charging infrastructure. We find that a lot of that concern actually does start to disappear doesn't disappear entirely, but there, there does appear to be an outsized concern about the sort of sentiment around charging electric vehicles to the realities uh, once people spend more time really digging into it. So something I'm quite keen to get into a bit in our conversation. We'll move on to the next slide, please. Um, so actually I'll skip this one if we keep moving on. I'm running a bit short on time. Um, Another really important question, particularly given how much we've spoken about emissions, um, we do find that while things like the price, power, the performance of electric vehicles are seen to be very important, we find overwhelmingly, and we've, as I say, we've been asking this question for five years now, each year what we find is that people say that the, their ability to reduce their environmental footprint and reduce emissions is the top reason why they are interested in buying, in thinking about electric vehicles in the first case and why they are supportive of them and want to see more of them on our roads. And that that environmental consideration and the whole list of considerations about issues going on in their lives is also a very high one. It's something that they would like to see a more effort taken to be addressed, both by themselves in their households, but particularly also um, through the businesses that they buy from and uh, particularly from their governments as well. We keep moving on. Uh, and so again, what we find is when, you know, of course the electric vehicle is as clean as the power that you use to charge it from. Uh, so there's this whole national conversation going on about the sources of our electricity. Uh, but then again, what we find is the, one of those great benefits there is the electric vehicle today gives you the opportunity to be at zero emissions right now. So there's, one way that you can charge an electric vehicle, which is just from the power that comes out of the grid and sort of waiting for the grid to continue decarbonizing. The benefit that we see today is that there's already a quite significant benefit an electric vehicle compared to a petrol or diesel one is about 30 to 40% cleaner power just off of our grid today than an equivalent internal combustion engine or a petrol or diesel vehicle. Um, but the neat thing is that every year that you keep driving that vehicle, the grid continues getting cleaner and that same car continues getting cleaner. But you also have the opportunity to leapfrog all of those things and charge your car from renewable sources, whether you have rooftop solar panels um, and you can charge from them, or if you choose to just buy green energy from an electricity retailer, you don't have to worry about all of those things. You don't have to wait for sort of national system and for federal politics and for all of those type of things. Uh, because you can make that switch right away and choose just to eliminate rather than just reduce your emissions. Let's keep moving on. Um, I actually might not uh, sp speak too much more about these next few points, if that's okay, but particularly look at what it is that we can do here in uh, Australia to help catch up with a few of those other markets. We provided some information there about um, how particularly other governments around the world provide things like rebates to encourage people to buy electric vehicles really exciting time for us here in New South Wales, uh, where the sort of first and we've got the best of these programs uh, in Australia so far, where if you buy an electric vehicle priced under $78,000 uh, today, you will not pay need to pay stamp duty on that vehicle. 
And if you buy an electric vehicle priced under $69,000, you'll also get a $3,000 government rebate. The combination of those two are creating something like a $5,500 price reduction on the price of buying a, a new electric vehicle today. And uh, while the stamp duty elimination is going to stick around forever, you'll be hearing a lot about it. That $3,000 rebate applies to the first uh, 25,000 vehicles sold. So there's also a message of urgency there of the ability to get in and be able to buy an electric vehicle cheaper today than you'll be able to in a year or so from now when those 25,000 allocations all run out. Look, I'm going to leave my slides there if that's okay. And you mentioned that there was, you promised that there was a lot of questions. So I'm really keen to get into a bit of a discussion with everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bayad. That was really interesting. Um, now, we have had quite a few questions come in. Um, and so I'll ask uh, Bayad, I'll ask you while you were talking, I might ask you to, to take the first question. Um, going back to the start of the, the chat there, there was a few questions about um, batteries exploding or catching fire. Um, would you be able to give us any information about how often that happens or how risky it is or you know, is there any uh, link between the safety of electric vehicles and especially when compared to petrol powered vehicles? Yeah, no, I think in that question, you've hinted to the answer, which is that it is very rare and not often at all. It's how often you hear about it. I think that's the broader factor there. So uh, we particularly, we have to somewhat rely on some of this data from the United States, for instance. And there are some, uh, so look at the data from the United States, there are some when it comes to petrol and diesel vehicle fires and explosions, there are about 1,200 instances every day. Zero media reports about them because they're just pretty common. You know, a lot of it's 1,200 because a lot of them are quite minor, but some of them are also quite major ones, sort of causing explosions or causing larger fires. But they're just somewhat status quo, and we know how to respond to them, and you know, we do, and no one, no one ever hears about it. But because electric vehicles are the new technology. There are the actually the instances sort of per capita between the electric vehicle and petrol diesel populations, instances are far lower. So you know, there's good news there of the amount of additional sort of things like encasing that goes on in wrapping uh, the battery of an electric vehicle. You know, the, there's what I was talking about a bit in my presentation before of there are some natural design elements in how you build an electric vehicle and how you add the, a battery for an electric vehicle into a car that are actually safer than the way that we and out of necessity are safer than the way that we build um, and drive internal combustion and or petrol and diesel vehicles. It is really just a, I guess, because it's new media is a bit more fascinated by it. And so you're going to hear a lot more about each one or two instances of, uh, of things like battery fires or battery explosions. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, and maybe, maybe um, Kim will be able to answer this one, but either of you, uh, if you want to weigh in, um, there was a question about vehicle to grid and using your, your vehicle as a home battery um, to, to better utilize your solar panels. Uh, I believe that some of this technology is already built into a few of the new vehicles that are being released. Um, yeah. But if any of you are happy to, either of you are happy to yeah. expand on that. So the most current Nissan Leaf can do that. Um, uh, so I have got the second generation. So mine's from 2019, but the latest leaf that they're selling has that capacity to actually charge to actually charge the house as well. So you need the hardware for it. Um, I haven't explored it because I'm hoping to keep my leaf for a long time before, but I would love the, the new leaf, but it'd be like a waste of money to buy a new leaf just to be able to charge my house when I have adequate charge now. <laughs> so yeah. So, Bayad, are you able to add anything there about the cost or the infrastructure that you'd have to install in your house to turn your car into a, a mobile battery? Yeah, so um, Kim's right in that the car needs to come prepared with the technology for that. And so far, uh, it's just the, uh, actually, well, there are two cars now. There's the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which is a recently released one, and the Nissan Leaf um, that come with that capability built into it. Uh, the only other, so you'll, when you have an electric car, you'll usually also have a, um, a charger for an electric car as well. Then there is a special inverter that you would buy for that with that car and that charger. 
Uh, there's still quite new and pretty cutting edge technology, so it's not as common right now, but having that capability built in is a, because companies are working on precisely, not what the tech, like the technology is available, what companies are working on more now is what the product that goes with the technology is, um, because outside of, you know, power users and people who are really into their electricity system, the assumption is that most people won't want to be sort of deciding when they want to use their car battery or much like with solar panels and batteries, it's how can we best automate it so that people can still use their cars as cars while reducing the price of, of power for themselves and for other people. And really, it's a really great and fascinating aims around here of potentially because of the sort of net cost of trading energy. So selling energy from your battery when, when energy is very expensive and then charging it when it's very cheap, we would potentially make charging an electric vehicle free. So getting you know, the, the ultimate cost savings, which is nothing, which is lovely, or even put money back in people's pockets for charging their electric vehicle as long as they do it the right way. Okay, that's great. And now both of you own electric vehicles. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how often you have to use public charges and how often you charge at home? Bad, you, you mentioned about um, changing the mindset about how we refuel a vehicle. Yeah. Um, do you, do you find that you just plug it in each night and charge it at home? Or do you find that you're more often going to a public charger? I can say, so look, people often ask questions about, you know, how many public charges are there? How fast do public charges charge and all the rest? And because I do this for a living, I know the answers. As someone who drives an electric vehicle, I, I wouldn't actually know the answers. I've probably used a public charger two or three times now, each of those times really for fun because I've wanted to see what it's like. 100% um, of my charging is at a home, usually my own home. Once or twice, it's been at a holiday home back when we were allowed to take holidays to places. Um, and it's, you know, driving, you know, we drive not very far in the country, but places like, you know, burying things and then charging when we get there, essentially, because you can, any anywhere there's electricity, you have an electric car charger, you can just plug the car in uh, and off you go. Um, but also, you know, for those people who, do want to whether it's going longer distances or don't have a driveway inside of their home there are public charges and those there are public charges that are constantly getting faster as well the things that i'd say is you know, if you have a real frank assessment about how often you drive how far you drive and how far you drive how often um you know like what i find is i recharge my car once about every fortnight and it's the simplest process you know when people ask how long does it take Again, honestly, as a driver, I don't know because I charge the car and I go inside and I watch TV and, and the car is charging. It's really not something you have to think about. Again, what we find is there's a lot of conversation and consideration about how many charges are there, how long does it take to charge? And that distress about that exists right up until people buy electric vehicles. And then we find it largely evaporates. We will think, actually, I'm really just worried about this a lot more than the reality is, is, you know, is necessary because you know, what we do find about particularly private vehicles, sort of vehicles that, you know, the just the average household will own, it actually sits there doing nothing about 96% of the time. And that's even if you drive to commute to work every day, between the time that you're, you know, it's sitting at home or sitting at a car park or sitting at your workplace, 96% of the time, the car's doing nothing. The car's just sitting there and that's time that it can be charging. Yeah, great. And, uh, Kim, you, you've mentioned to me previously that uh, you've driven to Canberra and had to charge along the way. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that experience? So normally I charge at home once a week when it's a sunny day, I just plug the car in all day and it charges. And so and so with Canberra, I maximise my charge. And um, there is there are two charging stations. There's one in Mittagong run by the NRMA. And uh, I charge there even though my battery is not complete like it kind of gets to about 40%. Now I charge Mittagong. Now I drive from Mittagong to Canberra. Now there is a charging station because uh, for a while now, when you buy a Tesla, the charging stations come with it. So there were a bank of charges for Teslas, but not, not the Nissan Leaf because you have different um, plugs for different cars. And I have a Chadmo plug. And then they built a bank of um, charging stations in Goulburn. So now when I go to Canberra, and uh, I go to camp and lobbying politicians about EVs, air pollution and climate change. Um, I charge in Goulburn and then I drive to Canberra. And so I don't, by the time I reach to Can Canberra, I still have about 40% charge from Goulburn. So I don't actually 
then because I stay at the same place all the time, I just plug into a normal PowerPoint at the place I stay. And, um, and while I'm there, they just let me plug in into a normal PowerPoint. So I've been with my LEAF, I've been to Canberra about maybe eight times and it has been no problems. I just have to organise it so that I have like 40 minutes to charge in Goulburn, which adds 40 minutes to the time. Uh, but apart from that, it's actually not been a bother. Okay, uh, so a lot of people probably would stop for a coffee or hmm. stop for something to eat anyway. So it's probably yeah, not so too big of an impact. Yeah, some like the charging, both charging stations, and one's next to a workers' club, and the other one's next to a cafe. So yeah. it, it actually takes it, like you just have to plan your journey so that you know it will take forty um, minutes longer. Um, but you know, it's no biggie. Uh, and um, there are more and more charging stations coming up. And if you, there's a few apps now, one's PlugShare, and you can actually see the number of um, charges there are. And because you can plug, like most, like my car just plugs into a normal PowerPoint. I just, you just have to marry, remember to carry your cables with you when you actually travel, but it's not a problem at all. And I've got okay. friends who've driven around Australia with their electric car. Yeah. And Either of you can answer this one. Um, what do you what do you find? Is it does an electric car fit pretty well into a normal lifestyle? Like Kim made a few references there about having to to plan your trip differently. Other than a long trip, is there any other inconveniences or is there any other benefits that we might not have spoke about? Mm, the servicing, like it's like barely any money. You only need like my last service is like it's once a year. It was one hundred and thirty dollars for that once a year service. And what do they do in an electric vehicle service? Oh, actually, I should ask them, shouldn't I? <laughs> but they are, do you know what they do? costs are so much lower. And like even just the feel of getting to an electric car that like I catch because my son's still got a petrol car and I had to drive his car and like it doesn't accelerate as quickly. It's not as quiet. And it was just so weird driving a petrol car. So, and but because once you actually get in an electric car, you realise that it has amazing acceleration. And my daughter told me to slow down the other day. Um, and, and it's just so smooth. And like, like when you yeah. drive, it's just the whole, the feel of the car, just sitting in car, it feels like such a much smooth, smoother journey. So I reckon if anyone gets into an electric car and you have a driver around, you'd be a convert because it's just such a much more pleasurable drive than driving a petrol car. All right. Well, we might do a quick fire um, question and answer now. We've sort of running out of time. Um, I'm happy to go a few minutes over, but I don't want to hold everybody up. Um, Bayad, could you tell us a little bit about road user taxes in, in the shortest period of time, um, about uh, regos and uh, other forms of taxing of vehicles, then how, how is that going to work in the future? Yeah, so New South Wales has come up with a really great approach to this, which is to say that um, they will introduce a road user charge for electric vehicle of electric vehicles of 2.5 cents for every kilometer that you drive, but they'll only introduce that once electric vehicles make up 30% of new vehicle sales or 2027, whichever comes first. Uh, and in order to help get that, you know, get get to that 30% by that 2027, they also have this whole range of things like rebates and, and other things. Uh, really importantly, though, one thing that they're doing is they're taking away stamp duty so that stamp duty, electric vehicles will never have to pay stamp duty again. Uh, instead, they'll replace that with that road user charge. And it gets really valuable because the problem that we have, whether electric vehicles or not, is that you know, people, and particularly when you know, people on lower incomes, hold on to their cars and we end up getting much older cars, which are less efficient. They require a lot more petrol. They're more expensive to run. And they're generally less safe as well because they've had more wear and tear. They've got all the technology in them. And it becomes then that barrier of if you want to trade up to another car, you also have to pay a few thousand dollars in stamp duty. They're saying, well, we can stop that from being the case. We can make it slightly easier for people to be able to trade up, get a newer vehicle, a safer one, a more efficient one by getting rid of that point and instead we'll make it a, you know, a cents per kilometre charge. So again, a, a really good way that that can work, um, you know, particularly, I guess, in that delaying it in incentives, it's why... We find there are electric vehicle incentives right around the world. It, what it's essentially doing is recognizing that driving a petrol and vehicle, a petrol or diesel vehicle today, 
creates pollution and there's a cost to that that right now taxpayers foot the bill for for you know all the impacts of that pollution and so one thing that you can do is to add more add more charges right you sort of sort of the research shows that the tax on petrol would need to be more like a dollar or a dollar ten per litre to reflect that. Now, no politician's going to want to introduce a dollar ten tax on every litre of petrol. So instead, they say, well, why don't we instead encourage you to do the other thing, which is to buy an electric vehicle, uh, rather than to keep sort of accumulating these costs. Okay, great. And uh, as far as price parity with vehicles, is that something, is there such thing as price parity? Will we see uh, the Rivian costs the same as a Ford Ranger one day. Is that something that, that's going to happen? Or will the, the upfront cost always be higher, but the running cost make up for it? Yeah, no. So today, the fact that there's a higher upfront cost is entirely down to the battery, right? And the battery today makes up about 50% of the cost of an electric vehicle. And the battery's already gotten something like 83% cheaper over the last, what is it, nine odd years now. And as it continues to get cheaper, this is why so many people are excited for electric vehicles and are preparing for the boom. Um, throughout this decade, particularly in the middle of this decade, it's expected that they become about the same price. You know, cars will always have different prices based on whatever trim or anything that you want, but that on average, they'll be about the same price. But then electric vehicles will keep falling as well. So we'll also enter into a period where and you know, maybe by next decade, where electric vehicles are cheaper to buy as well as being cheaper to run that internal combustion engine runs. Okay, great. Uh, there was another question about um, cyber safety and I guess the security of uh, these smart cars. Uh, do you have anything to add about that or is it similar to all computers where we just need to, to remain vigilant and try and stay one step ahead of the, the curve? I'd say it's similar to all cars. So along with electrification, the other thing happening to cars is they're becoming more connected so they can speak to each other speak to the traffic lights, speak to, you know, what GPS systems or wherever else it may be. Um, and you know, I'd say much more than, you know, there's an appreciation by car companies that they're not an iPhone, you know, an iPhone's pretty expensive, thousand dollars or whatever. Um, and there is a certain amount of expectations for things like safety and things that you have for a thousand dollar iPhone. If you're paying 40, $50,000 for a car, your expectations are far, far higher. And the repercussions of the wrong thing happening are also far, far higher. So there's actually a, the amount of investment and work going on to make, uh, whether it's from cybersecurity or sort of other systems, uh, improve safety is actually having a better benefit to the rest of the computer world, you know, to like laptops and, uh, and smartphones and things as well, because you've got these multi-billion dollar companies going in and saying, this is non-negotiable for us. If someone hacks into a car, they could cause real mayhem. It's not like you know, stealing the phone numbers from your mobile phone, it's a really big deal. So we actually have to fix it. It's not, uh, it's not something that we're leaving up to chance. Okay. Uh, another question um, has come in. I think we've probably covered the need for local fast chargers. And it sounds like there's a lot of them rolling out through um, some of the other yeah, petrol stations are starting to install them. So that probably gives a good indication of what they think is going to happen with the market. Um, to see if there's, there's one more that I saw um, about charging plugs. There's a few different around. Can you can you give us a bit of a rundown on that and why is there a few different ones? Yeah, so this is something that the industry has largely solved here. There's two around um, and it means that if you're charging at home, you can use any home charger and that's fine. And if you're charging out, you know, what we call DC fast charging, these are the type of chargers that look a bit more like a petrol bowser. They're sort of big monolithic things. Um, they'll usually have two plugs attached to them, so much like being able to pick up the petrol or the diesel nozzle and putting that into your vehicle. Um, that was a, There was a bit of a hangover where there were more plug types than that before. Um, and that was just uncertainty about Australia. Of you know, Everyone recognised that, yes, we should standardise. The question is, which standard are we going to use? Because you know, nobody had gotten around to coordinating that. Um, that sort of continued to be a problem, which is why we got together as an industry and just made the decision, essentially. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, do you have any uh, anything else you'd like to cover there, Bad or Kim? Yeah. I think I think we've covered yeah. a lot of things. Are there, another one, uh, petrol and hybrid cars. Uh, 
yeah, hybrids and hydrogen cars. Is there any, I know you're the Electric Vehicle Council um, CEO, but what's the future hold for those technologies? Yeah, so look, we cover all sorts of zero emissions vehicles. Um, what I'd say is, you know, while there's still sort of research and things going on into areas for hydrogen transport, that's now much more focused on particularly large trucks and maybe things like aviation, so airplanes, uh, the sort of consideration around what role hydrogen might play in cars is largely a, you know, that, that's pretty well settled now. Um, there's, I mean, it's not quite here yet, but hopefully in the not too distant future, things like B double trucks and things may be able to be hydrogen and sort of carry freight around. So that's sort of where the investment is sort of continuing again, continuing on. Okay. Okay. Um, and another question, what happens if you break down in the country? Does someone have to come and tow you like they would in a petrol car or I've been watching uh, the long way up, which is a, a motorbike show. I'm not sure if you're, if you're familiar with it. And that, they show the Rivians, um, being towed by other vehicles and that charges the battery through their regenerative charging. Is that, is that what would happen if you ran out of battery out in the country? I mean, that's one option. Um, there are also, I think something like the Hyundai Ionic 5 has a one car can actually charge another car as well. So you can plug your car into another car and sort of lend them some of your electricity. Places like the NRMA and things are also now um, they're carrying around or at least some of their cars are carrying around batteries so they can top you up a little bit. Um, that's generally, though, if you're, you know, within range of something and you need a little bit further to go, if you're hundreds of kilometres away from absolutely anything, then, yeah, you jump in a, you know, you jump in a tow truck, that's right. Okay. All right. Um, look, I think we've covered everything. I'm not, what I'll do, I'll just bring up our last poll. Um, and that, that will be, it's the same as the first poll. And... We would just want to see whether people have changed their mind on uh, the EVs and how soon you'll buy another one. Um, I'll just roll through and just make sure we haven't missed anybody's questions. Um, it sounds like we're we're on the path to getting a, a wider range of vehicles coming in. Yeah, there's another one about fuel excise. I think we covered that. Um, and one one more thing to add on fuel excise, I, I, I suppose, is that petrol and diesel powered cars aren't charged for their environmental impacts. So although EVs aren't being charged for a road user tax at the moment, EVs don't pay for the pollution damage that they cause so, and the health impacts. Okay, I think we'll end that poll. We've got a fair few answers there. Sorry, everyone, that we've run over a little bit of time. There's a lot of good information coming from Bayard and Kim, so I wanted to keep going. Um, oh, actually, Bayard, I had one more question that we mentioned at the start. Uh, will a, will an EV tow my caravan or my boat as we were promised it wouldn't last election? Is, is there any truth to that? Yeah, no, you, you can find electric vehicles that'll uh, tow a caravan or a boat. Um, you know, when you're, as I say, when you're looking at like the range and where you need to charge, you know, I get much less with a petrol or a diesel vehicle, it's going to use more power in order to be uh, by charging as well. So just take that into account. But it certainly has the capability to. So yeah, I think that's a, uh, it's something that I think even the person who said it is backtracking on hearing some more of his recent comments about okay. electric vehicles okay all right all right well i think that's it everyone um i think we've got some good information uh, if anyone's got any further questions feel free to email myself or um the email that sent you the um invitation um and if it's a question for kim or um, bad i'm sure they'll be happy if i pass them on yeah Actually, there's a question about bulk buy for EVs. I know my friends okay. in North Sydney have done that. Um, so, uh, so Nick okay. Tan, look at um, there's North Sydney Facebook group that is about EVs and they've done bulk buys there. Okay, great. And one last thing, I know people are already starting to drop off. Um, we are planning, assuming that 
restrictions ease and we can go back to doing the things that we like doing. We're planning to hold a bit of an EV expo later in the, or early next year. And we'll be getting, uh, inviting people who already own EVs and possibly some car manufacturers um, to come together in a park somewhere. Everyone can walk around and have a look at the cars, touch them, look at the dashboards and, you know, work out whether uh, an EV is good for you. Uh, talk to the owners because I think from my experience, the, the best advocates for electric vehicles are often people who have already bought one. Um, and I've never heard anyone who's bought an EV and say they want to go back to petrol um, or, or diesel. That uh, Everyone who buys an EV loves them. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that'd be great if we could get people together in, in some sort of expo. Yeah. All yeah, right, everyone. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much for organising this, Zach. No, I, I should have thanked you two at the start a bit more. Um, Bayard and Kim have both done this out of, um, in their own time. Uh, they haven't charged council for this presentation, which is very generous of you. So we, we really appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thanks for everyone. You're welcome, because this is a good course. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks very Thank much. Have so a good much. night. Bye. Hey, Zach.